Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, recorded and touring drummer, Blair Sinta. And now, Rich Redman. What is up out there in podcast land? Rich Redman here. This is another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show coming to you from two cities. Jim and I are in Music City, USA, and our guest today from sunny Glendale, California. Jim, I'm really excited about this because I went to college with this young man. He's so young that we were talking about how we are reading, <laughs> our, using readers now and how we have to use our flashlights to order off of a menu. But this guy hailing from Ann Arbor, Michigan, he comes from a musical family, top call Angelino drummer on the road in the studio for the last 20 years. This is some of the people that he's toured and recorded with. Alanis Morissette. Annie Lennox, Adina Mazel, Chris Cornell, Stevie Nicks, Damian Rice, Melissa Etheridge, Anastasia. The list goes on and on. My pal, Blair Sinta. What's up, man? Hey, what's up, man? How are you doing? Very good to be here. I, you know, considering all things, you know, I'm okay, man. I'm okay. I, well, you're, you're at your, your home studio, The Donkey Den. Yes. The now, Den. Warren Hewitt wasn't able to get the reason why you called it the donkey den out of you, but Rich Redman is going to try. So why do you call it the donkey den? Yeah, well, I think it's, I think it's really like an inside This, is, going this right is the kind of thing that's funny to me and to no one else. Well, I mean, try. I mean, is it, is it X-rated? It's not at all, actually. I know it sounds, some people have commented like, wow, dude, really? You know, but no. <laughs> um, I used to want to get a dog. I used to think this was hilarious, by the way, many years ago, right? When I was, before I was mature, right? Uh, I used to want to be able to get a dog, a very small dog, and go outside and call for it and say, come donkey. And people would say, that's not a donkey, that's a dog. And I would say, I know. That's the problem. See, that's not funny to anybody except me. <laughs> that used to make me fall on the ground laughing. Come on, donkey. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Because I'm kind of a cat guy. You but know, here's I, the I, thing. I do now have a dog named Moose. Come here, Moose. Come here, Moose. So, yeah. I wanted to, so, I wanted to name our dog Stay. Yeah. Mere Stay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Good, come Stay. Good. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, but uh, Blair, what kind of dog <laughs> is it? Is it like a? Stain. Is it like a? Lap dog that you can take it's, on an airplane, or is it a giant Marmaduke type? No, no, no. It's a Labrador. It's oh, a white okay. Lab. Yeah. yeah. Actually, my son, th my son thought of it, which is even better. My eight-year-old son. So I, I'm just like, hey, man, the the genetic line passed through of dad yeah. jokes. You know what yeah. I mean? So yeah, exactly. That's dad funny. jokes. See, I told yeah. you it wasn't funny. <laughs> I mean, I think this is crazy. I mean, if we, if you go, it's 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 very marketable, and it's got a, you know, it's got a ring, it's got a ring to it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So if you guys are consuming this with your ear holes and you're not watching, Blair is sitting behind a gorgeous set of DW drums. Everything's all mic'd up, fresh heads. He's got some Istanbul cymbals. He's super stylish because you have to be in Los Angeles or you don't get hired. But you're, you're in Glendale in, in a converted garage, aren't you? I mean, it looks like a state-of-the-art recording studio. It is converted. It's a two-car garage. No one in Los Angeles uses their garage for anything except storage or... Uh, recording things these right. days. Yeah. 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 But you were an early adapter because like if we go all the way back, you and I went to college, you're a couple years younger than me. So when I was at North Texas State getting my master's degree, we were all in there. There was like 150 drummers vying for positions to play in 10 lab bands where we would work on our reading and our styles and our musicianship. And it was highly competitive. And I would be leaving a band and you would be coming in to set up. And I think we had like, what, maybe 10 minutes every mm -hmm. day to like set up really quickly. That's right. That's and right. The, the stress of setting up your hardware and your symbols and being ready for downbeat. Yep. Yeah. And being ready for, which is kind of like the real world. I mean, North Texas state university, of North Texas was very much, I think a reflection, a truer reflection of what the actual world of professional music is compared to a lot of other, I would say state colleges. I mean, uh, wouldn't you think, I mean, I mean those no doubt the, the, certain real world application of what we were taught was like head on. Right. Like, yeah. No and doubt. then recently we got to go to drum channel and, and hang with our 
wonderful professor, Ed Sof, and some mm-hmm. of his students like yourself, Keith Carlock, Jason Sutter, Craig Pilo. It was an amazing time. I mean, it was just, it was really cool to kind of. Pay. It was cool. To, yeah. It was cool to reminisce with Ed and, and talk to him as a peer, like we were just talking about, and like, yeah, reflect. You know, because it was definitely a stressful time. You sure. know, at least for me. I don't know about you, but you know. Oh, it was stressful. I mean, yeah, it was heavy. Yeah, yeah. Where yeah, did you go to school before that? Because you were. Well, there, I went to were... Texas Tech. I, it was like a. Okay. It's a smaller school. My teacher was Alan Shin, and I was like the big fish in a small pond, and I just got to do so much playing. Right. That by the time I got to North Texas, it was like, oh, you know, I had kind of like my own take on how to do things. But then I got to soak up all the cool Henry Oxtel and Robert Troma and Ron Fink and Ed Sof isms and put that in my bag of tricks. Right. It, it was right. a really great time. And then I remember, uh, you know, moving into Dallas. It was like uh, Adam Gust, Luke Adams, Craig Pilo, uh Keith Carlock, we all kind of moved and were kind of like playing in the Dallas area and all sorts of, and everybody was trying to save up enough money to figure out if we we're going to go to New York or LA. And Jim right. White went to New York and Keith went to New York. And in six months he was playing with like Steely Dan or the Blues Brothers. <laughs> and then you moved right. to Los Angeles and I'm the one crazy guy. I end up moving to Nashville. And then I remember keeping, trying to keep in touch with you a little bit. And I remember this crazy phone call. I can, it's like as clear as day. It was like 1997. Uh-oh. And I was, I was like, Blair, how's it? What's go, what's going on in LA? What's the scene like, man? You're like, oh, man, you were with Don Sento. Okay, remember? yeah. And yep. you were in a car and you're like, bro, bro, I'm playing some smooth jazz and I'm playing like in some like cumbia bands. And like, and then you were trying to go over Laurel Canyon and I lost okay. you for like 12 years. 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> but then in right. the last, I mean, but you're busy like making plans and you're a family man. And then in the last eight years, I've been kind of like, couch surfing and in now I'm very committed to live the last right. five years being in Los Angeles. Um, and we've got to visit a whole lot more. Right. Exactly. We kind of have reconnected our, our drum brethren. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. So, but what was, so you, you moved to Nashville and like, I remember moving to Nashville on like a Tuesday and on the mm-hmm. Saturday I had a gig with a wedding band, mm-hmm. which was not a dream of mine, but it was some work and I had yeah. to pay the rent. So what was it like your first week in Los Angeles? Okay, so that's man, that's funny. Um, I moved out here, and Don Sento was here, and he's a guitar player friend of ours, and he lives in Austin now. Wow! And John Button was out here, and yeah. John now plays bass in the Who, and has played with Cheryl Crow and all kinds of people. And there were some other North Texas guys. Funny enough, I didn't know them at school, but. I ended up moving in with them. John moved out of this house and I ended up moving in with them. Yeah. And I wouldn't say it was just within the first week, but within like three weeks or so, I was in a band with these guys. Was that pedestrian or what was that? No, it was a friend of mine named Kirk Wheeler, uh-huh. who's a really great writer, one of my best friends out here. Um, a drummer named Steve Norton, who okay. he, he plays in a band called Loud and Swain still. He lives in Arizona. Um, but we all lived together and there was a composer. I don't remember the order cause somebody moved out. There was a composer named Chris Carter. So it was like a jam house. You guys were all like living together. All of a sudden we were, I was just living in a house and I was playing in like a band and Steve Cotter had moved to LA. Do you remember Steve Cotter? Yeah. Heck yeah. Jazz guitar player. And Steve was like, Hey man, I'm playing in a bookstore in Laguna beach, which is like an hour from where I was living. It pays 25 bucks. You want to come play? <laughs> I was like, yeah. So... <laughs> I was doing $25 gigs in bookstores the first week I moved here. <laughs> yeah, Jim, Jim talks about hamburger gigs versus steak gigs, and sometimes you just have to take a lot of hamburger gigs until you finally get that first slice of fillet Migdon, you know? Dude, I did a lot of hamburger gigs, man. Yeah. And, and you know, the funny thing is the price of gas, somehow that $25 was worth it to drive for an hour and play. I don't oh, know Laguna's how, beautiful, you know. Well, that too, yeah. yeah. I must have got some kind of food out of it. I don't know. So I'd come home with like 15 bucks and be like, woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> but you do it and then you press the flesh and people started talking. And then I remember yeah. talking to our mutual friend, Rob of Sharian, who is such an amazing drummer. Um, right. And he's also hailing from Ann Arbor. And I was like, you know, he's like, yeah, man, Blair, uh, I got this gig with this chick named Jennifer Page. Right. That was like early on, right? She had a song called Crush. Yeah. Remember that, Jim? Because it was like, 
Jim, Jim used to work at Jack FM, so so it was oh like, oh my god, yeah, for yeah. sure, yeah. I totally would, but the routing I can't get to come through Zoom. Oh, unfortunately, we're going to. If we're going to, we're going to get that to together. Sing it. No, um, yeah, I got that. That was '98, so I'd been here for like two years. But it's obviously that seemed like forever. But yeah, um, I and John Button was on that gig actually. So I remember flying to like Florida with John, and I was kind of like, holy shit dude, we're on a plane and we're flying to Florida to do a gig like with a, yeah. like a and, and that was like a number one single on certain charts. You know Yeah, I mean? so did you guys do like GMA and Today Show and that kind of stuff or? We did Donnie and Marie. I did that too with Susan Ashton, yeah. We, we did uh, Howie Mandel. Oh my God, don't shake his hand. <laughs> <laughs> don't shake his hand. Does he fist bump at least? No, the fist bump wasn't a thing in 98. That's true. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Really? Yeah. yeah. Not, not People were still high fiving. Or what were we doing? Because we we're shaking hands. Yeah, oh I, don't I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Sneaky yeah, I got to play swipes. some. Yeah, I got to play some TV shows, and I got a Zildjian deal out of that at the time. Yeah, and I was like, woohoo! Yeah. Well, I love your Istanbul symbols. I, there's like not a lot of guys I know that that play them, and they're just so dark and sexy. You know, they really. I don't think the people at Sabian would mind me saying that because it's a completely different animal. Pretty different. Yeah. 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 All hand I hammered. Like him too. Yeah, it's all some, hammered. some crazy dude with a hammer, like just growing a beard, like all day. There's just, just one guy. <laughs> just swinging guy. away. He does every named, single one, yeah. <laughs> one one guy named Istanbul. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Have you hey, ever gone? Dead. Yay. <laughs> have you ever gone to, and where they give you the hammer and they have have you try it? No, but I've heard it at the Nam show and it's the worst thing on earth, right? <laughs> just, you know that guy? <laughs> Sabian <laughs> does that. They have the guy hammering the symbols in the middle of the Yeah. <laughs> And and they won't, but, center. and you could try it. Like if you go up to the factory <laughs> McDuckdick, like they passed the hammer to me, and you know the guy's over my shoulder with his arm crossed, and of course I got the spiky hair and the overpriced leather jacket, and he's looking at me like this guy, and I'm yeah. I'm just sucking, and then he I, I pass it back to him. I'm like, you guys you ever, the have you ever swung an actual hammer, Rich? Uh, I try to avoid these things because I'm you know I don't change my oil, I don't cut my own lawn, I have people for this. Have you ever driven a nail into a piece of wood with a hammer? I'm sure I've I've done it one or two times in my lifetime. Okay, let's yeah. make it sure. <laughs> you, hung, you hung those pictures on your wall, nice behind you. Oh no, I I called I called somebody for that. <laughs> they came with their tape measures and their extra reinforced studs and and. and Remember the time how you and Hal Bowman came over and I told you I changed my own oil that day, and we looked at you like what. Like, what did you do? We're just too yeah, busy yeah, for that. Oil. Leave my it to the that. experts. My dad used to do that in our garage in the middle of the winter. Change yeah. oil. It, it, you crawl under the car. Let me show you how to do this. I never did it, yeah. but I did go in there and I've observe. done it several times. Yeah. yeah. Now, isn't your dad a world-class saxophone player? He is. Yes. Is he and still playing? He still plays, not really publicly, uh, but he still pl he practices every day. That's like what his that's what he does, man. Yeah. So against yeah. Ag against everyone else at the household, he's just walking around in his underwear, blowing like Charlie Parker songs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just gonna. I'm not even gonna tell you because you said that, and I'm enjoying that imagery. I'm not even gonna tell you like how it actually works. I'm just gonna leave everyone that listens to the show with, yes, that's how I grew up. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> he puts on a like a John Oates wig, some dark sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the day. It could be a Kenny G wig. It could be a John Oates wig. I, mean, and it, I it's, do this. It's like, oh, today's smooth, smooth day, or today is, you know, Charlie Parker day. You know. Yeah. I, well, you know, I remember when I was at North Texas, and then I went down and was playing with that band Random Axis, and it was the day. It was the day of the shiny loud shirt. You know, we were all shopping at like Chess King, you know, mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. smooth jazz was happening. I was saying to myself, I could take this in my mullet and my Dave Weckl mullet and go do this. Did you, did, did, were you doing a little bit of that when you first got to town or no? Who is that? I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> who was that? <laughs> I didn't do, I didn't really do smooth jazz. I did a, I'm, I'm look, I've done some. Yeah. I did some weddings. Oh yeah. You can interject anytime, Jim. Um, I know, I know. We, it's, it, we yeah. I played Got smooth pop. In and out Let's just go there. I played smooth pop. Not really smooth jazz, though. Yeah. I did play with Josh Groban, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, like, like, and he, he's had a couple fantastic drummers through the years. What was that like? It had to be pretty involved. Like, was is it things where, like, the click is like, 
like yes. retards and the, strings. The particular and- t- tour I did was he was doing Broadway songs, so yeah. it was totally that. It was like the craziest click. What year followed was that? the click. Twenty sixteen, not that long ago. Wow. Okay. He was on but the yeah. office a couple of times. Oh yeah. yeah. He's a really nice guy. Um, he, lo- he really looks like it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but I'm yes, serious. that was really that does. was one of the craziest things where like there's a giant crescendo going into like a chorus and the click is like slowing down and you're like, I hope I hit the downbeat every night. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But it was fun. It was a, super challenging. You actually have a click that will slow down and yeah. speed up. Yeah, you would just you follow. You literally follow the click. Like, oh wow! Yeah. So like, yeah. I get it. I'm not that much. Of oh, an idiot. sorry, Thank Jim. You. So yeah. Jim is hero of God rest his soul, Neil Peart. Um, I have a lot of heroes. I think I know, but you really. I mean, that was your that was your holy grail guy. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. I mean, he was formative for me. Then it was Carter Beaufort. And, and then Charlie Benante, who we had on the show. Charlie Benante, yeah. Yeah. Really? Jim was yeah. freaking that day. He was blown. Oh, he was, yeah. he was losing fan. his mind. Yeah. Wait, I saw I, you I, I've met a lot of people in my life, and I totally germed. I'm certain fam- that would be cool to meet guy. Charlie Benante. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good guy. Just Wait, I, he nice really guy. I, I yeah. saw you interview Jonathan Brooke. Yeah, Jonathan, because I I just love that record that she had, Steady Pole, that came out in like yeah. 99, 2000. It was yeah. so immense. And then I became great friends with her drummer, Larry Aberman, who oh, now yeah. teaches okay. at UNLV. Okay, cool. Yeah. Super, super I met small Larry. world. Yeah. She Many sang years for ago. Yep. Yeah. Wow. yeah, she sang like, on our show, like, which is amazing. I was like a huge we fan of her. Of the opera. Yeah, her very first solo record, which came out in like 93, and Abe Jr. is on it. And I think Abe must have been. Barry Jr. 22 years old or something like that. You know yeah. I mean? And he sounds like as good as he does now. It's crazy. The curious thing is Adina Menzel. Um, yeah. I mean, she's a, she's a force, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, which, uh, about what time frame were you with her? Well, I recorded with Adina for her first solo. Well, not her first. A solo record in 2006. And then... I did kind of a couple random things with her throughout the years, but then I actually toured with her in a summer uh, in 2015. And that's when Frozen oh, was so, big. So we were yeah, playing. Yeah, so you were playing Let yeah. It Go a lot, I would imagine. Like, that was the jam, dude. Yeah, so. that, was the, that was the jam. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, Wicked type of tunes, too? <laughs> a lot of Wicked tunes, yep. It was all show tunes and, yeah. Mm-hmm. Was but, funny. I mean, if you go deep into your, you know, I think the people, the listeners, when they read like a bio, it's like, if like I tell people like, look, it's sometimes you do one show with the person, you're a sub. Sometimes mm-hmm. they're a guest on the headlining show and they come out and sing a couple songs. Sometimes you only right. do it a, a television show with them. Sometimes you just right. play on a couple tracks on their record. You still did it, and you still deserve to put it on your bio. I mean, this goes deep for you, like Gwen Stefani, like right. Cornell. I mean, Sutter worked with Cornell. Fogarty, you know, Dave Stewart, better than Ezra. Emerson Hart is, uh, you know, I know him. He lives there in Nashville or yeah. did for such a long time. Yeah, he's there. Yep. Yep. And he's so, so on, yeah. On your LinkedIn, it says you're the drummer for the Jim Henson Company freelance. Yeah, that's one that's, of those weird things. They're like, link where you've worked. And I've like, yeah, I've recorded there. <laughs> so tell tell us about Henson Sound because that's on the list. Because I worked at uh, so I was I'm happy that it's still there and I hope it still stays for a long time. But I set my yeah. damn drums up right where Alex Van Halen set up his drums at Sunset Sound. I'm like, wow! Yeah. I would yeah. love to do this again, but if it never happens, because I mean, let's face it, some of these world class they're all they're dropping like flies. These places yeah. are all closing. Yeah. What was it like to work at Henson? Well, Henson's one of my favorite places, and it. I, I think Henson will be around because it's run really well. Yeah. Uh, there's a woman named Fariel that runs it, and she's, she's been there as long as I know. And she – I mean, I just think that Henson is – it's like it's got different rooms. It's, it's managed very well. It's sought after uh, – you know, I think John Mayer's been in there since March from what I've heard. Wow. So during all this, like – maybe not since March, but he's been there a lot of this year. And I think they're doing fine. You know what I mean? I think that's one of the few places that will endure. You Have know. you done Capital yet? I've done Capital a couple times. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it's all the same. Oh, my, my, the best thing about Capital is I met, um, oh, why am I blanking? Uh, uh, family guy, dude. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh um, 
Seth, Seth McFarland. Yeah. I met Seth McFarland. I mean, I just shouldn't even say I met him. I, I, we exchanged a few sentences that were just awesome. <laughs> you mean by like like the coffee and the bathroom I was, area? I was literally like, sitting in our in our in our room where we were tracking, and he he popped his head and he goes, "You guys have coffee in here?" And I said, <laughs> "I said, yeah, it's in that room right there." And he walks in and he goes, oh, it "Sounds really great in here." And I said something <laughs> like, uh, "I go, you must be doing something cool down there." And he's. I don't know. He has some sarcastic, like, really Of course he did. He was ready. And then he left, and I was like, yeah, that was Seth MacFarlane. Cool. (laughs) Yeah, you should have given him a singer after Shinga. I know. I know. (laughs) But, yeah, that's what I remember out Capitol is meeting Seth MacFarlane. (laughs) East-West? East-West, have you done East-West, I've done a bunch. Yep. 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 Just totally random stuff. Love it there. Sunset Sound, I've done probably the most. Yeah. It's just... I don't know. Like you, you mentioned Warren Hewitt. Warren, Warren works there a lot. I've done with Joe Tricarelli. Always wants to work there whenever I work with Joe. Yeah. Well, yeah. tell us about the, the Atlantis thing. How did that happen? I mean, something tells me it's friend of a friend, relationships, or was it a cattle call with a line down the street at SIR? How'd that happen? The Atlantis no. thing was this. I got hired by, I toured with this guy named Jude, who was a <clears throat> um, singer-songwriter in 99. <clears throat> and Jude had the same manager as Atlantis. So I t- toured with Jude in 99. I recorded with him a little bit, toured with him a little bit in 2001. And then, um, whatever, I'm going to try to make a long story short. I heard that she was looking for a drummer. So I called that management company because I knew them well from touring with Jude. And I said, hey, I heard she's looking for a drummer. Can I come audition? And they said, yeah, thanks. We think we have everybody that we want to audition. And I was like, right. eh, okay. And then like three days later, I was visiting with my girlfriend, who my now wife, then girlfriend. And so I was in New York and they called me back on a Sunday and said, so, hey, we haven't found anybody. Can you be in here Tuesday, like at like noon? And I was like, uh, yeah. So I was flying home already. I was flying home that Sunday night, I flew home. I was living in like a, a single, I was like a, like a guest house and I couldn't play drums in there. So I called up my homie. I was like, dude, I have an audition. I'm not telling you what it is. Can I come set up my drums in your spot? I got to work on these three tunes. So I went and practiced that day, took my shit down, went to the audition the next day. And like, I turned out to be the guy. Well, I, I remember hearing a story from other podcasts because us drummers are thick as thieves and we all listen to each other's <laughs> interviews on podcasts. And um, I think that you had the wherewithal and the experience and the sharpness of mind to take a chance and to say, do you want me to play the dynamics of this little room or do you want me to play like the balls to the wall rock drummer that you want to hire? Right. And she said, give me everything you got, right? I think the answer was a little bit, she was like, yeah, play. Yeah. She was like, play. And I was like, okay. So I played way too fucking loud for that room. But I was like, this is what's supposed to happen. So I'm going to do it. You know, yeah. So you took, like, you just had a, a gut feeling like lay in here, man. Like, uh, yeah. And the environment was like so easy. Like all the guys, I knew only one guy and the other guy in the room, but everyone else was like, you know, they were pretty, they pretty much knew they had the gig and they were like pretty relaxed. And she was like super cool and easy. Like within the five minutes I was in there and I was just like, all right, I'm just going to fucking, you know, I mean, you probably remember. I remember watching the MTV Music Awards and seeing Taylor do that in like '96. And you're like, Hawkins, and being like, "Who the fuck is that dude?" You know. So I was like, "I'm, I'm just gonna basically do that because that seems right." You know. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was a, a relationship that went on for years. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I toured with for like five years and then recorded a handful of records and then. She asked me to go out in 2008 and I, I was playing in a band that I really wanted to have happen. So I rolled the dice and uh, here I am today. <laughs> now, was that the pedestrian thing or what was that? That was pedestrian. Yeah. Okay. Band okay. called Pedestrian. Now, the other thing I, I like to brag on all my friends and guests and, you know, I accentuate the positive. Another part of your story that I love so much that I think people can relate to and steal from is that you wanted to teach yourself how to write songs so you could be part of, of learning a melodic instrument and, you know, writing lyrics and being able to produce yourself. So, like, early on, you 
bought the rig and got the guitar and went down that path. I'm sure you're glad yeah. you did. There's a, it's, it was kind of funny because I was touring with this guy, Jude, and we were in a van for like nine months. Ouch. And I was, yeah, I, I was like, I remember calling my dad three weeks into tour and I was like, I was like, we drive like eight hours a day and then I play for 20 minutes. I was like, this kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I ever had wanted to do was go on the road. Yeah. And he's like, he's like yeah. But the accommodations yeah. really like make a difference. Like we, were, we I just interviewed, you know, uh, Wally, Walfredo Reyes, and he was talking mm -hmm. about his whole family's background in music. And yeah. he was talking about this gig where Alex Acuna was picked up in a black car at his house, mm -hmm. first class at, on the on the airplane. Nice meal, land, black car, Waldorf mm -hmm. Astoria, Radio Music City, mm -hmm. you know, and then back to the house and he walks into the front door and his wife says, time to change the diapers and please take out the trash. You know what right, I mean? Right, but those right. accommodations on the road really are, they, they're very helpful for your peace of mind and oh, yeah. everything, you know? That's why it was so easy to tour with Atlantis because it was business class. We were getting paid well. We ate. I mean, that's when I discovered what good wine was, right? Nice. You know, I had a whole lot of food that, like, I never would have afforded or, you know. You're like, we're the all eating blowfish tonight, okay? <laughs> 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 there might not be a gig tomorrow. Exactly, yeah. I mean, it was like that. It was like that, yeah. yeah. So, but, yeah, the do you think, so, at the end, near the end of that tour, I, I, I bought a, a Telecaster. I was like, I'm going to learn how to, like, write songs because, I, you know, I don't know if I can tour my whole life. And, um. I really spent like a long time, like, like learning how to become a super hack guitar player and writing crappy lyrics and singing like shit. And the funny thing is I started to do open mics. Cause I was like, I gotta, I gotta do this out in, in public. That is brave Blair. And, and the very last <laughs> time I ever did it was the day that I auditioned with Alanis. So I went and I did the audition and I felt pretty good about it. Yeah. And my head was like all over the place. And I go to do this open mic thing. It was actually like a gig, like a 30 minute, like I'm going to do my thing. And I got a phone call and I missed the phone call and it was from the management. So my head was just like, I was just like a wreck. And all I could think, and I played the worst fucking gig on earth. It was like, I can't imagine what it sounded like, but all I could think of was, there's a reason why they're calling me. That's, like, that, that's pretty I got to call them back dude. as soon as I can. Yeah. So I, I finished my gig and sounding like shit i shut my shit down and every, you know i had friends there they were like and i just left i was just like i've got to go and i went out to the street and i called them and like, like changing hey, phone call yeah hey she wants you to be in it if you're interested i was like i'm in and then i got to go back inside and it was like hey where'd you go and i was like i just got hired <laughs> so that was like a pretty cool thing but that was the last time i ever did that I yeah. love those musical moments. So where were you playing? Like at the Genghis Cohen or something? Or like where? Dude, I was like, playing at the Rainbow Room. The, upstairs. The, oh, the little tiny venue upstairs at the Rainbow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, but good for you. It's an iconic place that like Lemmy, like, you know, sat at the bar for 20 years, you know? Yeah, for some reason I could, I don't know why, but I was able to get a gig there doing that. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to musiciansmortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179. NMLSconsumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. 
Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. So that kind of opens up things for you. And then you develop this relationship with Glenn Ballard, right? Because we talk about relationships all the time and how people are the gatekeepers to all successful things in life. And then he starts hiring you for Annie Lennox and other folks. Yeah. And that was through Alanis because Alanis would have her band record on her records. And that's how I was able to get in front of Glenn, which is kind of crazy because that's rarely happens right like touring yeah. band road band like then you know you're not good enough dude like what okay yeah you know, you know. that was yeah. definitely the culture when i moved to nashville in 97 it was like you the, the business was so prosperous and was so so uh healthy at the time that yes you were either a touring guy or you were a session guy and then slowly but surely the lines have blurred and now you could be a touring guy a session guy and an educator all at the same time right you were i mean you obviously were able to do that yeah the no, lines early on though well just because right? i think mentally i said i will not accept this fate i right. said you know i feel like the energy that you bring to a recording session will, will let people go wow this guy would be great in front of a live audience and then if you're in front of a live audience and you're you're able to entertain but play with the meticulousness and the efficiency and the musicianship of a great recording drummer you're gonna play on records right and then in the middle of all of it why why not teach a few people you know what i mean and but you were kind of doing session stuff early on, right? When you moved there? Yeah, yeah. I was like, you know, singer songwriters, like here's a three chord song and they're expecting you to get it in a first take. And, right. you know, and that, that's really the culture of Nashville. It's like the sessions I've done in Los Angeles, it's like, it's two o'clock and we're still getting a drum sound. And in Nashville, we have already recorded 10 songs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. just, a, just a different mentality, you know, right. but uh, right. I embrace both. <laughs> as you must well i well let me tell you this i one other thing i've noticed is that and i want to give you massive props is that you have an awesome uh educational package at uh called sticks and wires tell Thank us you. about that a little bit so i i kind of dove into the youtube thing like a handful of years ago and i've been really inconsistent with it but when the pandemic hit, Jim's shaking his head, going, "The only way to do YouTube is to be consistent." Yes, I exactly. Yeah, but I'm, I, I'm guilty of it too. Yeah, I understand. Me too. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I started to get phone calls off the hook from people, drummers who were stuck at home. Hey, man, can you tell me how to do this? Hey, man, can you tell me how to do this? <laughs> and I gladly give up the information. But then I was like, "Oh, wait a minute! I've made videos on these. I should sell these." So they were never meant to be like sold in a certain way. But I was like, okay, I can put together a little package and sell this. And it's super basic, useful information. And now I've, you know, I've done my homework and I'm like, oh, this is what I should be doing to make a product. But like, yeah, you know, I think the information in there is good. And it's a bit, it's a bit, um, the production value is not high, but the sounds and the information are good. You know oh, I mean? totally. Like, so everyone check out BlairSinta.com. It's S-I-N-T-A.com. And it's, it's like a super... A great website you can check out. You can say like you can hire Blair, you know, to do recording sessions from his studio there in Glendale. He's going to send the files to you. He's going to be super meticulous about it. And then he's also, you could study with him online or you can download these packages right to your device, to your laptop. So I got your basics of recording package. I'm just right. like, I'm, I'm a fellow supporter. Like I just buy my friend's products because I know the sweat equity and the blood and sweat and tears that goes into making a product. And it's great. So it's things like, uh, how to get a great sound with one mic, then two mics, then three mics. Yeah, how to tune your drums, getting different sounds out of your snare drum, choosing the right bass drum. Um, all the stuff, uh, microphone phasing, like all right. stuff we need to know because, uh, you know, unless you're, you're, if your head is in the sand, you do, you will not realize that if you're a drummer in today's world, you have got to have a place that you can record yourself. Yeah. If you don't, you are behind. Yeah. And you're calling your friends and giving up half the fee of your, your, 
you know, your rinky dink fee. Yeah. For somebody to engineer your drums. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I was mean, on your website yeah. and I was looking for a bio of sorts. You, do, you, do you not have one up there? I don't really have a bio. I'm, you know, the website thing is tricky. And I just tried to go for what's important, which is, right. please hire me. <laughs> but I think, I think he has a wiki. I think you have a wiki. I th- I'll get your bio on there. There might be hurt. a wiki. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, it's you got always, the pedigree, you might as well use it. No, but yeah. the filmmaking is gorilla. It is like, hi, Blair hair. Yeah. Did, you, did you like shoot on an iPhone or, or iPad or what was it? A lot of it's iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. But who was, cares? It's like well, what, when I moved to Nashville, I was like, look at, I want to learn how to play country music. So I want to get Tammy Wynette's greatest hits and George Jones. I bought that on, on used cassette. I didn't yeah. care. I just yeah. want the information. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is like, I was talking to Sutter like years ago and we were talking about YouTube and I was like, oh man, when I put my name in YouTube, it's just like, you know, weird random footage from people from the audience on their yes. iPhones. And I was like, I hate that. He goes, yeah, dude, you got to take control of that shit. And I was like, right, you're right. I do. So all I had was an iPhone. I was like, okay, you know, I'll just, I'll just do it the way I have it. But I think, like I said, I think the important thing is that it sounds good because it's recorded well. And now I'm like, okay, I have better cameras and I got some lighting and I you know, sure my hair is good. Zoom and, and, and <laughs> you know, Zoom and uh, GoPro are making such amazing, I guess I'll call them prosumer cameras, but mm-hmm. there's like a new Zoom camera that I'm going to get. I'm going to get like three of them. I think they're like $225. And it, Zoom camera? It's like, what is it? The Q10, QX10 or something, Jim? But wow. it's like... Something like that. It's a... Um... But the audio and the video is killing like you you don't have to have a separate mic it's like built in oh, wow. q2 sound, the q2n so yeah. so i didn't tell you blair but now I'm, I'm basically teaching um i'm teaching in 2021 at mi and the drummers collective and and but i've got to have the cameras around my drums right because everything is online Right. So you you buy a little lighting package, you get a couple of the cameras, you get some sort of a switcher, then you're a like you're basically a full time educator. Right. And then I have a switcher. Yeah, yeah Jim's got a yeah. switcher. Yeah. Let's see it, Jim. Is there a sound oh, effect oh, for oh. a switcher? I do have a switcher. Yeah, I'm gonna I think I'm gonna get the black magic one, which is around maybe four or five hundred bucks. And then that Roland's got mean. one where you can hit pads and change cameras. This one is actually uh the ATEM Mini. No memory um, card. Oh, there's no some seats. Card. There's some there's nice seats. seats. There's an elf on a shelf. And there, are, elf on a shelf. Do I don't know what is that thing. Shelf. That's my oh. uh, Infinity Gauntlet. Oh, yeah, so yeah, that, Are you a Marvel Infinity guy? Or are your kids Marvel guys, uh, Blair? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So have you seen all twenty three movies? Uh, probably twenty one of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we're in a Star Wars thing right now. Like yeah. it just flipped to Star Wars, which is fine. So that's the thing know? I don't understand yeah. about Rich. He loves Star Wars. You'd figure that with Star Wars comes Marvel. The Mandalorian is incredible. So like I'm completely, I'm just one episode behind on the Mandalorian, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've got some actor buddies of mine who are, all had bit parts, which, which mm-hmm. I'm so excited for them. That's cool. Um, yep. You know, the check goes very quick. Everybody thinks that actors are, are all millionaires, no matter where they are in the Right, the pyramid. Wait, you're not, <laughs> dude. Come on, um, but I. It, it begs the question. It begs the question. If you had all the money in the world, would you still do the same thing? And would you hustle as hard? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> what would you be doing? I'd still play drums, but I would just like get a band together and just go. Okay, what yeah. kind of band would you want? I would, I don't know, man. I would be like Silver Lake Rock. Yeah. I would just play whatever I wanted. Like, who cares? Yeah. See, I, I would like to be in a tribute band. E- okay. Like really? a combination. Like what? Like, like, a, like a Journey bon Jovi, and... Okay. Bon Journey, Bon Jovi, ACDC. So, Jer Jove DC. Or <laughs> Bon DC. That needs some work, buddy. You know, Bon, bon DC Ernie or something. Okay. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> See, like, you know, like a couple times there's been like the lottery where it's like, it's worth like $565 million. And you're like, well, pff, I'm going to go buy a ticket because why not? And then you go, what if I actually won? What would I do? And like, so you, you know, have $225 million to, to, to your name. Exactly. Yeah. 
I mean, you, that would change a lot of things, right? I mean, oh, you're no, already living the dream, minute. Blair. You, you're already a creative that has that puts a price tag on their creativity, enjoys right. the process. You live in the most celebrated, uh, I would say, places in the planet. Mm-hmm. as far as like real estate and sunshine mm-hmm. and you're, you're feeding your family. I mean, this is like, you mm-hmm. are winning. Yeah. I don't take it for granted. That's for sure. But I'll tell you one thing. If the going rate for a home studio per drum track is a hundred dollars, I hope that Blair Center is charging more than a hundred dollars because you're way, you're, you're way worth every penny because of your pedigree and the amount of blood, sweat and tears that you've put into things. Yeah, is is that, that the going rate? <laughs> well, there's that, that very surprising. It's not my it's not my rate, but there's a right. bunch of guys that I know that have a that guest bedroom be. in their house yeah. that are that are cranking out hundred dollar country demos. Yeah, bad idea. I mean, God bless them, but yeah. yeah. I are mean, you, I, I, are you ahead, charging Jim. more than that? Yes. Good. Well, yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 I mean, as you should. Uh, yeah, because I'm. I'm going to put, I'm going to hope, I hope, you know, hopefully what I'm going to put on there is helping your song and your, you know, everything yeah. about it, you know? Well, yeah. And you're going to slave over the kit choice and the snare yeah. choice and the cymbal choice. And, you know, if you go to BlairSinta.com and you want to check out a sample of some of Blair's sounds, because he, he's a mad scientist with sounds. So he's got a thing where he's got like, here's the 1960s Motown vibe. Here's the 70s, no bottom heads, tons of gaff tape sound. Here's the 80s sound with tons of rooms. It sounds like it was recorded in an aircraft carrier. Here's the 90s, like I'm wearing flannel and so depressed sound, you know, and, 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 and it's like he slaves over this stuff. Right. 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 I mean, that's what, that's what you're going to bring to the project. Right. It's not cookie cutter ever. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I mean, I feel like, yeah, I, I make it, it's, I got to, you know, I'm trying to feed a family. What's you know your, what what's mean? your favorite yeah. era? Cause mine is the, is mine really is the seventies. For music? I really thought it would have been the eighties for you. No, for me. Well, I mean, yeah, because I was a teenager in the eighties. But reluctantly, I wish I was a teenager in the 70s, but I feel like some of the best music was from like 1968 to 1982 is a massive sweet spot of popular music. Mm -hmm. And the drum sounds in the 70s, I don't know. I just love that over gaff taped eagle snare drum. I love the no bottom heads. I I just love that. And I just feel like a lot of the great songs of of that century were in that 10-year period. Right. I kind of feel like 1973, there was something crazy going on with incredible songs and incredible sounding records. We're talking like you the know? running on empties and the, the Elton John stuff. Rumors. Like, and yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Just in there, just yeah. something like Fidelity hit a certain sweet spot of, of like people tracking like together, but like the sounds were separated no. enough, but it was yeah. still like cohesive band playing oh yeah like damn the torpedoes like over at um sound city mm-hmm. did you ever get into sound city before they, they went away or never played in sound city no damn yeah so we're talking like yeah you know, all the rick springfield stuff some some fleetwood mac stuff some uh ronnie james dio did i say that like just a lot of folks i mean yeah yeah if those walls could talk yeah, apparently if that carpet could talk, but yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, imagine all the DNA elements that are in that carpet. Yeah, that's that that they talk about that carpet in that documentary. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was listening to a, there's a great podcast that I, I recommend. There's a it's called Off Off Camera with Sam Jones, and Sam Jones is mm-hmm. like he's a, he's kind of like a celebrity on set photographer. So it, say someone is uh, born on the Fourth of July. Sam Jones is probably going to be the guy that's like taking all the stills of all the actors on set, cool. drinking coffee and all that kind of stuff. And so he's got this great podcast and he had Dave Grohl on and what a likable guy. And yeah. he said something to me that he said, and that wasn't to me, but it resonated with me that he said, he said, my favorite drummers aren't prog rock, odd time fusion jazz drummers. They're disco drummers. He goes, I want to, I want to listen to, you know, 
the gap band and stuff like that because those guys just played repetitive patterns but it was so soulful and so funky and so solid so he goes basically i'm a punk rock disco drummer i was like what a quote unbelievable yeah i mean yeah have you ever met dave I, I'm assuming that over the years you've met him at some point. Over I've met him a couple times, yeah. And he is like the nicest dude on the planet. Yeah. And the last time I ran into him was, geez, two or three years ago. And I was actually, I was having a coffee with an engineer friend, Daryl Thorpe. And we were across the street from East West. And we just, this was just kind of random. And, um, I was like, dude, what are you working on? He's like, oh, I'm recording the foos right now. I was like, oh. And then we finished coffee, and he's like, you want to come across the street and look in the room? And I was like, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, it just so happened that it was like the time when everyone was showing up. You know what I mean? So I've met Taylor a handful of times, so I yeah. ran into Taylor. But Dave was the first one to get there, and I was just looking around the room, and they had like five different kits set up around wow. the room in there. And we got into a conversation. It was brief. But like, and he mentioned, man, I don't even remember how the conversation got there. And I'm not going to talk about names, but we were talking about people that had auditioned for the foods and the time. And I don't, I have no idea how the conversation got started. It just rolled. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he mentioned a certain drummer that's like incredible. And he was like, yeah, no, just, I I wasn't down. You know what I mean? Well, there's probably some sort of a element that yeah he can't go. I'm not saying, (laughs) but there's there's. I mean, I was like, I was like, wow. There's some sort of intangible element. I mean, because when you when when you realize that that guy is completely self taught and he, he, I don't think he finished high school. I mean, he literally is just like. But what a success story to change the world of music on the drums and then change the world of music as a front man. I never understood like, like. I can't imagine that Dave Grohl sits down out behind a set of drums every day to keep his chops up. But whenever you hear him, it's just like, he sounds as good as he always does. Yeah, totally. You know? I, I, like, I love this interview with, with Anderson Cooper and like Anderson Cooper is like six inches away from Dave's right crash. <laughs> and it, they were on 60 minutes and like, and then he's just wailing. And then Anderson's like, like looks like this, like he's like, it's like a jet and airliner right. taking off. He's like, yeah, that's loud. Sorry. Right. Right. <laughs> so crazy. I got to find that. That's hilarious. Well, I tell you what, you know, like looking back on this stellar career, man, I got to say I'm, I'm super proud of you because everything that we were dreaming about 20 something years ago, Mm -hmm. we fucking did it, man. Yeah, man. Well, I would, I would say the same to you, dude. Right. High five, man. Yeah. But now looking back, this is harder than ever for the kids. Say there's a kid going to Berkeley, MI, North Texas, University of Miami. There's a, there's a international, there's an international global pandemic. Yeah. They want to break into the music business. (sighs) What's the advice you give them? What'd you learn along the way that you can impart? Um, <laughs> no well, I mean, first of all, I think everybody thinks differently than we did now. You know what I mean? Um, I, I don't think it would be like, like if you had said to you and me, like, hey, you have to learn how to like put mics up on your drums and engineer them. We would have been like, Pfft. we were like, dude, pros do that. We're just going to, yeah, exactly. Kick ass. There's like, I would, first of all, that's too daunting. I would never do that. And why would I do that? Whereas now, you know, I don't think anybody blinks twice at, you know, if you're young, you know, you got to do, you know, social media, got to record yourself, got to blah, blah, blah. So I would just say, man, pick your thing and just stick with it. You know, you got to go all in. Yeah. If you're going to do it, you got to go all in because when you don't go all in, it's, you can't, you know, you got to yeah. go for a while. There's got to be no backup plan. Right. Backup plan. Well, the funny thing Burn is, is that ships. we, we had yeah. a backup plan. It was a sense that we could always teach, right. Sure. We could always work at another area of the music business, but that wasn't going to happen. We were so full of piss and vinegar. We were like, we have something to prove and we're going to go yeah. do it. Right. But I really do feel like location is everything. It's almost like uh, owning a restaurant. You can have the greatest food in the world, but if you're not on the right street corner and don't have the right advertising, no one's going to come into your restaurant. Mm-hmm. Like things would have been very different if you hadn't moved to one of the recording capitals of the world. Oh yeah, no doubt. 
I mean, uh, it was. It's even surprising to me how New York, like you know, everyone has moved from New York. Now, I, f- I always feel like there's three drummers in New York. It's like Sean Pelton and Wolf, and uh, yeah, you know, I don't know. <laughs> someone else yeah and wolf's got a girlfriend in west hollywood so he's not even out there right exactly yeah and it's like the day mark giuliano moved out to la i was like all right that's it like (laughs) you know i mean giuliano was in jersey but you know nobody can afford new york i mean it's like you gotta make afford la well more it's another thing well you got all these corporations moving out of california yeah but blair's really smart because he got his house when it was the right time to buy the house luck well it doesn't matter if corporations are moving out jobs go with them then what? That's true. Yeah. Plus, well, there's a massive yeah. homeless problem. I don't think it's bad in Glendale, but every highway trestle I see in Los Angeles is an encampment. It it's so crazy, sad. It's crazy, man. It's you crazy. Know. Every time I drive by a new place and I see that, I'm like, what is happening? Yeah. 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 Hey, maybe they so, haven't figured out. They're in this cool community. They got fires going at night. They're probably playing their guitars. You know, I look at that and I think of um, uh, <laughs> me and Bobby McGee from Janis Joplin. Mm-hmm. You know, the one I'm thinking of? Yeah. Why do you freedom's think of that? Just, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Yeah. Wow. Jim. Yeah. That's very profound, man. Woodstocking us, Jim. Yeah, but it's a, it makes sense. Yeah, man. You know, we imprison ourselves with our stuff. So, Blair, next year, it's going to be a better year, right? Dude. It's got to be a better year. It has to be. It's got to be. Yeah. So what are you, what are you excited about? Year, though? Well, I, I, well, I think it's going to be, it's got to be a better year. But was it that, was 2020 all that bad? Well, you, I feel like you have the life, life by the balls because you, I don't feel like your life was necessarily impacted by it because everything you do is on the microphone. Mm. You don't have to travel. You don't have to, I'm talking yeah. about you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jim. Like, oh, yeah. Jim. Jim's a voiceover artist, and he produces about 15 podcasts, and then he has a, um electrical company, and he has- I've, I've, I've had a lot of different conversations with business owners this week that talked about how 2020 was a great year for them. Oh, yeah. Well, I if you figure that. out a way to pivot, like, but the poor yeah. musicians that- Now, the guys that are writing, have, like myself, have been writing a tour bus for 24 years, and their suitcase has been packed. My suitcase has been packed for 24 fucking years, right? Yeah. So if I hadn't been able to pivot and do other things, I would have been toast. Hey, Jim, hit us with yes. the favorite part of the show. It's you the you- random question, random question, random question of the day. You kind of threw me down there. I don't want to make sure that I was all queued up. <laughs> hey, that's Jeremy Little's jingle, and that's him singing. <laughs> Is it really? <laughs> yeah. I love it. That's, that's him mutual. singing. That's our mutual friend. Yes. I got a question all queued up, though. Okay. Blair. Yes. What's the most overrated product out on the market? <laughs> <laughs> the most overall or most overrated for me? For you. Or whatever, Most whatever comes to mind. Overrated product. It could be ever in the history of products. Wow. This is a random question. These kind of things make me stressed. Because um, <laughs> I feel like I have to come up with something good. God damn it. You can pass and get another one. <laughs> Jim, give him another one. Here. Yeah, we'll give should me get another. some music. Yeah. I want some music behind. Blair. What is your favorite thing to eat or drink? In the winter. <laughs> Chili. Boom. That's one I can answer. <laughs> oh, my God. It was one eighth note behind. <laughs> really? <laughs> Zoom has a one eighth note latency at that BPM. Nice. Dude, that was almost locked in perfectly. That's oh my pretty God. bad advertising, actually. Though this guy plays an eighth note off, man. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> if well, you I mean, want your, your track to be an eighth note behind. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Chili <clears throat> is a very, I mean, that's straight. That's very Michigan. Yeah. Yeah. And these right. are indeed very random. These are random questions. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah, you know. that is very Michigan, though. You're right. Yeah. Totally Michigan. Yeah. Well, hey, man, if, unless you have any parting thoughts, man, it was so awesome to have you on the show and catch up in a public forum. My, my parting thought is thank you. Uh, thank this was a pleasure. I could have used more sound effects, random sound effects. <laughs> oh, we got that. Yeah, I know. Uh, especially for the warm-up that we had that no one heard. But um, <laughs> the warm-up is always the juiciest stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Come on, people.
That's a good one. Yeah. There we go. No, man. Thanks for having me. It's great to chat and laugh and, uh, you know, talk to other people outside of my 2000 square feet here, you know, <laughs> I love it, man. Well, I'll be back in LA the second week of January. So hopefully we can, we can catch up if everyone's masking up somewhere we can, we mm-hmm. can all get out, but man, uh, happy holidays. And, uh, thank you for doing this. You too, brother. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. And to all the listeners out there, first of all, Jim, thank you for what you bring to the table, your time and talent, man. It never goes unappreciated. We'd love you, man. And to the listeners out there, we have an email address, the Rich Redman Show at gmail.com. Send us your comments. Send, send us your praise. We'll, we'll read the letter on the air. And be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Blair. This has been the Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com.